This is Identity at the Center. If it has anything to do with IAM, this is the go-to podcast. Now your hosts, Jim McDonald and Jeff Stedman. Welcome to the Identity at the Center podcast. I'm Jeff and that's Jim. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Oh, not so bad yourself? I'm doing great. Um, You know what I realized was we never did a 2024 prediction show. So I'm not I'm not going to try to revisit that now. We're going to we've got a whole plan for the show that has nothing to do with that. But I predict I'm going to spend a lot of time learning about ITDR this year. I just yeah, think it's like I think it's the technology that is the true game changer. The more you know videos I watch and products that I mess around with and read documentation. I mean, it's where it's at. And then. <clears throat> As you know, I'm working with a, a client in my day job where we're working on like having a privilege access management strategy. And I mean, it's a big um, organization. I wouldn't call it decentralized, but there's a lot of different groups that are doing privilege access management. So what can you do centrally? I don't think you can stick a monolithic PAM solution right in the center and expect that that's going to manage all of your privilege access. But what I do think you can do is have a centralized vision command and control or at least an alerting platform that kind of shows you here's what's going on in the environment that looks fishy and you can predefine responses to some of those events. I know we we talk about this all the time. It's like, oh, Jim, you just woke up to this? No, but I'm getting really excited about it. Hmm, Okay. I mean, I think like uh, a lot of this is logging, right? I think, and I've said it before, I think ITDR is sort of the evolution of what we called user behavior analytics or analysis or user amenity behavior analytics or analysis from like a decade ago. That's great. I think, you know, I think the assumption at this point is, is that most organizations now have the appropriate logging in place to be able to take that data and do stuff with it. Hint, hint, if your organization does not have that yet, probably should get on the, get on the, on the bandwagon and start to figure out how you're going to collect that data. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, ITDR has had a little bit of a moment in the sun. I feel like the last year or so has definitely gotten some play. Certainly Gartner shining a light on it a couple of years ago has kind of opened the eyes for it. And we've seen some pretty cool products. So yeah, it'll be interesting. I was going to say, if you have about the prediction show, I, I was going to say, well, I'm, I predict that we're not going to do 2024 predictions and then I would <laughs> automatically be right. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think we're I think we're at that stage now. So, I mean, one thing I can tell, I another thing I can predict is that we're going to do a voicemail QA uh, show here. We're going to record it. This the, we're really pushing the limits, right? We're going to record it on February third. So this episode drops January 29th. We're going to record it the following the next Saturday from that. And then we're going to drop that episode on February 5th. So there's still time to leave that killer voicemail. Just go to idacpodcast.com, click on leave a question, record a, a short voicemail question. And if we choose your question as one of the five that we're going to air, we've got a free digital copy of Phil Winley's um, Learning Digital Identity book. And uh, it's a fantastic book. So I think it'd be a really nice win if you're able to get that book. Yeah. So you've got till basically February 2nd, let's call it maybe, to get the voicemail in. And I think we're only doing this for voicemails, right? So you got to go to idacpodcast.com, click the talk to us banner on the screen. If you're on the normal like desktop website, it'll slide in from the right. If you're on mobile, it's on the bottom. Or you can just find it on our contact page. But the idea here, Jim, right, is it's a voicemail, not someone just writing an email in or something like that. Right. Actually, someone did send me a question via LinkedIn, and I directed them to the voicemail box. And that was over a week ago. They never did it, so I'm mm-hmm. assuming they weren't comfortable with it. <laughs> but, I mean, look, this is Use a, voice to text. I mean, just, like, you know, drop it into some AI thing. Oh, yeah. You could do that. That would sound really weird, but, okay. Or you could send right. me the question. You could do that. I can run it through my filters and make it sound like you or I are asking the question using our voice because, you know, we're all deep fake now at this point. Yes. So I guess the next thing to talk about really is conferences. I mean, I'm getting excited for conference season to come. Um, what's the the news on Identity Week America? 
Yeah. So we are going to be at Identity Week America uh, later this year. We have secured through our fine friends over at uh, the Identity Week folks, uh, conference producers, Terrapin, stuff like that, uh, a discount for all of our listeners. If you use the code IDAC30, IDC30, you get 3% off your registration, which is pretty cool. So definitely looking forward to that again. I was there last year by myself doing some recordings. This year, you're going to be there as well. And uh, looking forward to kind of taking the next step and trying to figure out, you know, how these conferences, we can bring the podcast to it. But that'll be exciting. The cool thing about this, Jim, since I know you're wondering, is that IDAC 30 code is good for all of the Identity Week, conference, Identity Week conferences taking place around the world. So the one in Europe, in Amsterdam, June 11th and 12th, the one in America in Washington, D.C. on September 11th and 12th, and then the one in Asia, in Singapore, October 22nd and 23rd, the same code, IDAC30, you can use it for any of those or all of those. You know, maybe you collect stamps, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. passport stamps, and you want to hit all three of them. Um, I'd love to figure out someday how we get out to like Europe or you know Asia for some of these conferences, but um, we're, we're definitely going to be at the at the uh, United States one in Washington, D.C., so... Uh, you could show keep support for our, our conference game. I think the, yeah. the first conference we were in like a broom closet. No, no, <laughs> no. We actually had to get a, um, a sweet, sweet a hotel room, right? The sweet, sweet. That's right, man. Yeah. What a thanks what to RSM for that, the by the way. That is, <laughs> yeah, it was a great time, though. I mean, but now each conference, I think, what you know, the, the next step was we had a room on the conference, you know, area. And now it's we're becoming an active part of the conferences. So exciting stuff. Mm-hmm. We're gonna have to get like uh, ridiculous writers, like only yellow M and M's, just to make sure that people are reading, you know, contracts, <laughs> things like that. You know, because we're such high maintenance when it comes to things like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Only M- yellow M and M's. I love it. Jim, you had a question that I thought was interesting, and we're gonna pose it to our guest today. Is identity at the center for NIST? which obviously for us, we think it should be because that's what we're called, Identity the Center. Um, so we're going to ask that question today and more. We've got Ryan Galuzzo. He's the Identity Management Program Lead at NIST. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, Jeff and Jim. And, uh, and, and I'll throw a prediction out because uh, I, I didn't realize we were doing predictions. We were going to talk predictions, but um, a new version, a new draft of our digital identity guidelines will be out in uh in 2024 so i've got that to look forward to i'm sure we'll talk about that more later but um had to throw at least one prediction in i will also see you all at um at identity week in uh in washington dc where i will definitely be attending oh very good so we can give fist bumps of gratitude um and uh all that good stuff i think you can share in our yellow (laughs) m&ms that's right make sure make sure there's a yellow red (laughs) my son's favorite color is red and yellow right now so we can give him the yellow ones too okay um I believe, Ryan, this is the, not believe, but this is the first time you've been on the show. And like one of the things we try to do is really kind of understand the backgrounds of people who come on the show, since identity has such a varied history of different people and backgrounds. How did you get into the world of identity and access management? Is it something that you chose or did it choose you? Uh, it, it chose me completely by accident. Um, so uh, I... When I about 2011, I was uh, I was coming out of the United States Army, where I had previously been uh, an artillery officer, which has absolutely nothing to do with identity uh, at all. Trying to figure out what I wanted to do with myself, uh, you know, having a, a an early midlife crisis, uh, figuring out who I was, uh, thinking on the spectrum of uh, you know maybe I'll go back to school, get a PhD in like history or something like that, or you know maybe I'll move to Washington and join the National Security Establishment because I had no idea what I wanted to do. Um, but my father, who who was at the National Security Establishment, was actually down in the Washington D.C. area, um, and he happened to run into a, a colleague of his who had a nonprofit organization known as the Intelligence National Security Alliance um, that does uh, kind of research and coordination and collaboration between the private sector and the public sector in the national security sphere. Um, she happened to see him walking around with his bright red Red Sox hat in a Starbucks one day. They started talking, um, and she mentioned that they had a um, an internship program for folks coming out of the military to help get them kind of up to speed and and integrated to potentially get uh, jobs within the, the the public sector or in the commercial sector. And um, as a result, I came down, interviewed, got that internship. 
Uh, and I ended up working on a paper focused on HSPD-12, so Homeland, uh, Homeland Security Presidential Directive 12, which essentially kind of pushed the PIV card originally, the personal identity verification cards that we use in government, um, and, uh, and reciprocity of, uh, of background investigations. So I ended up kind of deep into this initial world of how do we share information, how do we establish identities, how do we establish suitability within the government, uh, and then how do we make sure that we don't have to do that 52 times for every single contract that you work on over the course of your life as a, a contractor to government. Um, from there, that kind of got the intention of some folks at, at Deloitte, a large consulting firm, and I ended up interviewing there. Uh, and joining as a very junior research, the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace, INSTIC Program Management Office at NIST. Um, those of you who are familiar or aren't familiar with, with INSTIC, it was a, a very large presidential initiative in 2011 launched by the Obama administration focused on um, advancing new ways to deal with digital identity. Um, sounds fairly familiar to a lot of the stuff we're still doing right now, um, but it introduced me to uh, you know Jeremy Grant, who is the who was the PMO director at the time, Mike Garcia, Paul Grassi. Um, as a very young consultant, very green consultant, I got kind of uh, dragged into a, a world where I got to meet some of the biggest players in the space and engage with some of the biggest names in the space and learn a lot very very rapidly. And it's been been pretty much all identity from there so so you could say my my dad's uh, red red socks hat uh, resulted in me being an identity <laughs> that's a pretty the cool world story. works in mysterious ways <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about your role at nist yep. what does i guess a identity management program lead at nist do and i guess for people who might be listening around the world who aren't familiar with nist can you kind of explain what the organization is as far as you know how it, how it represents the u.s in these kind of regards yeah, absolutely. So NIST stands for the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, very, I guess the best way to describe it would be eponymous. We do uh, we do standards for technology. Um, we also do measurement science and the research to kind of support all those things. Within NIST, we have what's called the Information Technology Lab, which focuses really on IT systems, networks, stuff like that. Um, we've also got a physical measurements lab. We've got folks who do like standard reference material. Um, I'm not sure if you've ever heard the story about our peanut butter, but um, we actually have the world's most expensive jar of peanut butter, which is used as a standard reference material for all the caloric studies that people do. But that's on the kind of physical and measurement side of the house. We're on the IT side of the house. Um, so we get the information technology lab, uh, which has a bunch of divisions. I'm in the applied cybersecurity division, where we focus on taking guidance, standards, stuff like that, transitioning those into the easiest ways to uh, execute and practice. Um, we've got the computer security division, which is the kind of traditional home of a lot of our 800 series uh, documents. 863 are digital identity guidelines, which I work on, uh, kind of straddle between uh, the Applied Cybersecurity Division and the Computer Security Division. Um, then we've got our Information and Access Division and a few others. But the bottom line is that each one of those divisions has needs to execute projects relative to identity. Um, so again, our Applied Cybersecurity Division, we're doing applied work. We're doing work within our labs at the National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence around identity and identity projects. Within the Computer Security Division, we've got uh, you know, 853, which is the kind of core privacy and security control catalog that has identity components. Uh, we've got our personal identity verification work that we do, uh, FIPS 201-3, so uh, Federal Information Processing Standard 201-3, which is our, our personal identity cards for government employees. That's all identity related. Uh, our Information and Access Division is where we have our authorization teams who work on things like attribute-based access control. Uh, we have our entire team that works on biometrics. So we've got a very robust biometric measurement team. Um, you may be familiar with facial recognition uh, vendor testing program, which is now the face recognition testing and evaluation program. Had a little name change and rebranding there, but the focus there is to help evaluate and measure these technologies. And my role, is to try and help tie those things into an overarching identity program, make sure we've got a consolidated view and set of strategic outcomes and goals that we're building towards, and just kind of make sure that there's, there's good connections because of the fact that because identity is at the center, it's at the center of each one of those different programs, it's at the center of each one of those different project areas, uh, and so we needed someone to kind of help connect, coordinate and stitch those things together, and that's, that's what I'm doing right now is, at, at NIST is my primary role. So I've always um, wondered this, who comes up with the idea that says, oh, we need to create some sort of NIST standard? Like, who's, who said, like, oh, we need to create NIST 863, Digital Identity Guidelines? Like, is there, 
a process where it says, hey, we need to create something like this? Or how does that process start? So there's a, there's a few different ways it could happen. One, it could be that we identify it through research and say, hey, there's a gap within the U.S. set of guidance for federal agency. And I think it's helpful to be clear that, one, this is non-regulatory. So what we create does not impact commercial entities. We, can't, we don't force it on them. We create the standard. If they want to adopt it, they can. Within federal government, what we create is standards or guidance, and it is enforced as mandatory by policy and legislation, but it's, it's not considered to be regulation. It's considered to be guidance or standards or guidelines. Um, and so the work we do for special publications can either be, hey, look, we've identified that there's a gap, um, or you know, policy might dictate, hey, we've identified a gap where we think there's a new one. So the White House or OMB, you know, kind of the policy authorities might say, there's a gap in our standards portfolio, or there's new and emerging techniques that we would like NIST to create a standard for. So we can either kind of be directed, or we can identify and, and, uh, and, and create something from a gap that we are able to identify through our own research and process. Um, so there's, there's kind of a mixture of authorities and capabilities there uh, to, de- to decide how we do these things. And, and a lot of times, it'll be a progression too, right? We'll, we'll do some market research, we'll do some analysis, we'll do some standards analysis to identify where there might be gaps, or things might become super obvious that there's no gap. There's no standards there whatsoever. And as a technology emerges or a technology gets adopted, we realize we need to kind of take some action on that. So Ryan, the, you know, NIST has so much respect within the industry and, you know, things like the NIST CSF and some of the standards like Jeff was referring to are, you know, the basis for how a lot of people approach um, cybersecurity and, digital identity specifically. And so this is your chance to kind of make it or break it for our podcast. I'm going to ask you the the central question here, is identity at the center for NIST? Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, I think one of the things to emphasize is that if you look at each one of those components, right, if you look at the, the cybersecurity framework, there are sections in there that point to identity and access management outcomes and objectives that need to be achieved. Um, if you look at 853, which is the baseline for a lot of controls that are being used, not just in government, but in industry as well, too. There's the uh, identification and authentication category. There's the access control category. There's an entire set of, or, or, uh, or, um, or families rather, of controls that exist in there that need one, the kind of initial control identification, but also, hey, we've got to have additional standards. We've got to have additional guidance that go around these things. And then I think most importantly, particularly as we start talking about the adoption of things like zero trust within the federal government, zero trust really kind of revolves around, in many cases, identity, whether it's identity of the individual or identity of a device and the attributes associated with that individual or that device, it becomes really at the center and core of those things. And so all of the projects that we kind of work on because of the fact that they're spread throughout everything, it's, it's really kind of indicative of the fact that it, it is crucial. Identity in some way, form, uh, or function is absolutely crucial to all of our different work streams, all the areas we have of responsibility. And it, and it continues to just emerge as well. Too. I mean, there's a lot of conversation going on around uh, AI and you know AI and the application of, uh, of, of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning a lot of the uses that we're starting to see are applied to things like identity. So how do we improve the use of biometric algorithms? A lot of times, those are actually using AI and machine learning. I mean, the the only uses of AI and machine learning are not just generative AI. It's also, you know, being able to look at things like algorithms. How do we improve them with this large volumes of data? Um, You know, how do we actually leverage things like uh, IDTR uh, coupled with AI and machine learning to be able to improve the way we detect potential anomalies in the behavior of identities and, and actually be able to take action on those. So it, it really runs through, I mean, whether you want to call it the center or something that just runs through and, and kind of ties a lot of these different security concepts together, um, it, it's, it is absolutely critical to all those things. Well, it feels like security when I, when I first got into IT you know, 25 years ago, identity was definitely not the center of security, of information security. It was the network. It was IP addresses and ports and perimeter. And now it's the zero trust model, which I don't think is overrated. Um, And it's building from, okay, you have attacks from the outside, but assume that maybe they got through the perimeter. 
but you also have attacks, attacks from the inside. And when attacks are launched, I mean, they could be anywhere from, you know, just the, the curious, overly, um, overly aggressive person that works there to somebody who gets an account and kind of lives off the land and, you know, just is poking around your network and trying to move laterally with their account, things like that. So my perspective is that, um, you know, we, we've made this great shift from identity was definitely not the center 25 years ago to, you know, that's where it is today. So I'm not trying yeah, to I, argue I, with you or anything. Cause I think no, you're no. on the same page, right. I'm kind of like backing up what you're saying. Yeah. And I would, I would, I would take it kind of one step farther. I think part of that evolution is an, an acknowledgement of that most attacks and most successful attacks, there is some degree of identity compromise that typically goes along with it because, you know, uh, entitlements, access, actions are typically taken either by, you know, an individual human identity operating within the system or an account or service account that's being compromised and, and used to, to conduct malicious activity. So if you start to kind of narrow down on some of those common factors that exist across some of those attacks, you start to see that focusing on solving some of those problems on identity really helps extend the different ways that you can, you can defend your organization. And, and I'll take it one step further as well, too. It's not just a security thing, right? Uh, what we do here is a lot of focus on how you can bring human experience and usability into the conversation as well, too. And particularly if you start to take a look at not just your enterprise use cases, but your public facing use cases, identity becomes the center of your interactions with the government in a digital perspective. Like, how am I able to you know, sign in and, and take care of uh, things related to my benefits? How am I able to access my, uh, you know, my social security records or my tax records, whatever it might be? At, at the starting point of that, that first interaction is an enrollment and a registration process and a proofing and authentication process that are all part of identity. And, and being able to do so in a way that is both secure, but also manages to provide some kind of a consistent user experience is really crucial to being able to have a good trustworthy relationship with government and, and the, the public that we serve. Yeah. And you brought up, um, ITDR. I didn't bring it up. You brought it up. <laughs> well, you, you brought it up while I was waiting to join. So exactly. <laughs> I had, so had to mention it, I guess. So I guess my question for you is overrated or underrated and, um, you know, evolutionary or revolutionary? I don't know that I can say what, one way or the other, whether it's kind of uh, overrated or underrated at this point. I think, Jeff, you kind of brought up the point that this is an evolution of, you know, the logging and auditing and collection of, of kind of event information to be able to actually take some action on it. I think, you know, regardless of whether you refer to that as, as you know, the kind of IDTR or whether you kind of talk, talk about it as a the continuous evolution and continuous monitoring process that you would apply in a zero trust architecture. I'm not sure how you want to slice and dice and, and kind of carve those things up. But I mean, I think at the end of the day, being able to, at least within the enterprise, be able to have really fine grained view into what's happening, what might be indications of compromise, what might be able to get you ahead of the curve on, you know, to, to your point, those those threats that may have gained a foothold before they move laterally, whatever it might be, I think it becomes it becomes really critical to your overall threat posture. Um, it becomes a little bit tricky if you're talking about applying that to more like a commercial public facing viewpoint because of the data collection aspects of it, the privacy impacts, uh, and how some of those technologies get deployed. But there's still value there, particularly from a fraud prevention perspective. So, you know, as a as a kind of like term, uh, I don't, I don't know how you know whether it's uh, overrated or underrated. But as a concept, as it fits into overall security posture and zero trust models, I think it, you know, it clearly has a lot of value. Okay, great. Um, so we talked, Jeff, actually throughout the the standard NIST eight hundred sixty three, which is in R three. I think I became familiar with it in R one, talking about it, levels of assurance framework, right? The idea that based on the the risk of the access, you'd implement certain levels of control around what hurdles someone would have to go through to provide a level of assurance based on the types of authentication they were doing. But I think it's much more than that. So maybe you could give us an explanation of 800-63 and then talk a little bit about why it's going through R1, R2, R3. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I, I think you a pretty decent summary, actually, of, of the goal of the, of the overall documents. I mean, um, revision one 
as you kind of pointed out, uh, I don't remember exactly what was published, um, but we've we've kind of reached uh, 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 a point here where evolution with revision three, which I, which came out in 2017, um, you know, we started to be able to see that you know the goal was to be able to provide controls that were kind of adaptable and flexible, so that organizations, specifically government agencies, but commercial entities that might want to adopt it, can help better mitigate risks associated with different aspects of identity. Um, so we had one volume in revision one, uh, and what we ended up doing with that that single revision was taking it and splitting it out uh, into three different volumes. So uh, so revision three, uh, four volumes actually. Revision three um, covers four different volumes. It contains all of the kind of technical and functional controls that you would need to execute identity, starting from your enrollment and identity proofing, going on to your authentication. And then going on to federation as well, too. So being able to be confident in your enrollment and proofing process. So how do I prove that you are Ryan? Um, your authenticator and authentication confidence. So how do I make sure uh, that when Ryan returns, it's the same Ryan that I registered and I'm, I'm confident that he hasn't been compromised in the meantime. Um, and then how do we remain confident in identity information that might be conveyed from one organization to another, or even within an organization through something like SSO and SSO protocols. Uh, and underpinning all those is our base volume, uh, which which covers your kind of risk management process as well as the identity models. So how do we speak the same language when it comes to digital identity? Um, but then also, how do we make the decision about what assurance levels we want to select within identity? So identity assurance, authentication, authentication assurance, and federation, federation assurance. So I'm wondering, so the, this level of risk, right? And maybe I'll start with this question. Is there a level of assurance or, or a level of authentication required where MFA is not like the bare minimum? And the reason I ask is like, let's say it's a really low risk asset. In other words, it's registration for T-Ball. And I have to go in and create an account. And I go in and I create an account and set a password and then... A month later, their database gets hacked. They push that out onto the internet. Now someone has my password. They go and try to conduct some sort of MFA fatigue or, you know, SIM swapping attack, but they have my password. Um, so I guess the angle I'm taking on that is like, if there is a level where MFA is not required, then it seems like the level of assurance is like the level of assurance I need to protect my asset not to protect the person who is authenticating to my asset, they if if I lose if I if I fumble their um, credentials because my asset was low risk and I didn't put MFA on it, now I just put their password out on the internet. What do you think of that? So I mean, I would start with um, we provide a suite of guidance that allows organizations to make their own risk based decisions, right? So we. We aren't going to go in and assess someone's applications for them and say, you should really be at this assurance level because that's not our job. Our job is to provide the guidance and allow the agencies to make their uh, organizations using it to make their own decisions about what risk level they're at. Um, as far as the federal government goes, we, I mean, we do allow at our authentication assurance level one, the use of single factor authentication. Um, now, if there is PII that's protected or PHI or uh, basically any personal information by policy, the federal government should be using multi-factor authentication. Um, and so within the context of the federal government, if you're protecting some kind of sensitive information, if you're protecting some kind of personal information, then you should probably be moving using multi-factor authentication. And I would say even more so, um, you should probably be thinking about using phishing-resistant authentication, uh, which we can talk about a little bit more later, but essentially something that is more robust than just something like a, a one-time password sent to your phone or um, a push authentication device that can be compromised through MFA exhaustion. But it, but I think I want to stress, and maybe I wasn't kind of clear enough on, on, on the kind of delineation, but we, we do have different kinds of assurance levels now. So right? it's not just the big one LOA, one, two, and three, and four that I think most people are use, used to. We actually have the ability for you to say, look, I want an authentication assurance level of one, two, or three, right? I want single factor authentication or multi-factor authentication, or I need, uh, you know, cryptographic authentication uh, in order to protect my application. And at the same time, you can decide, well, 
you know, based upon the potential compromise of the core identity, I might want no identity proofing or light touch identity proofing at IL1. I want, um, you know, stronger identity proofing at IL2. I want to make someone come in person and collect a biometric at IL3. Um, and then for federation, again, you don't, you might not be doing federation, but if you want to make sure you've got the most robust confidence in all of that authentication and identity information being provided by an external provider or to your other entities, you can select your kind of federation shirt at levels one through three. So um, you could even be in a situation, for example, where you want multi-factor authentication because you're potentially protecting something like uh, self-attested PII, right? Like of I've got like a, a, a you know a personal health tracker or something online that I'm uploading my workouts to and my diet to and you know where I'm working at, but you don't really care if I'm really Ryan, but you do want to make sure that someone who's not Ryan doesn't get into that data. And we now give the opportunity and through that flexibility and breaking those things up to allow you to be able to deploy multi-factor authentication and strong multi-factor authentication, in fact, um, to to protect that data without having to also identity proof me unnecessarily. Yeah, that's a great point. Really, what you're providing is a framework, and then folks have to kind of decide within their organization how they apply that framework and what their different levels are, um, and then apply that to their assets. So great points there. Um, So we talked about this being in R3 is, I think you said 2017 has been out since, but R4, what I understand is R4 is in the works. Can you tell us can you give us a little preview? If you want to drop any news here on the Identity Center <laughs> podcast, feel free. Uh, but can you tell us kind of like what to expect? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't know uh, that it is the you know a uh, complete breaking story, but so revision four, we published a draft of um, last year in December. Um, we had a public comment period that extended through April. Um, we got over four thousand comments, um, and for reference. On revision three, we only got, I think, about 2,000 uh, comments or issues that we needed to take care of. So we, we nearly doubled them. Um, and we're in the process right now of adjudicating uh, all those comments, working through you know, some major updates. Um, and so one of the things we announced that maybe a couple weeks ago is that we are going to do a full round of... So when we do our special publications, we always do at least one draft for public comment. Um, because it's very critical to make sure that we get feedback and input and that if we make updates, uh, we've got the ability to point back to that kind of community input um, as why we made some of those changes. Um, Sometimes if we've got something this substantial, and and this is really four special publications, not just one, um, you know, we have the ability to go ahead and do a second draft or even a third draft if we so choose to. I, I, hopefully we don't have to get to a third draft, but, um, you know, so the second draft will be hopefully published in the kind of April, May timeframe uh, of the coming year for a second round of, of public comments. And part of the reason that we're doing that is, um, even from the draft that we put out in, uh, in December of last year, where we, we made some pretty substantial changes changes, integrating things like bubble driver's license as potential options for forms of identity evidence uh, and verifiable credentials as well, um, adding context for phishing resistant authentication, um, and then adding a couple different forms of, uh, of, of, of federation to meet uh, federation assurance level three that includes this concept of, of bound authenticators that's far, probably way too complicated to get into on the, on the show, but if you ever want to follow up, we can have a conversation about it. Um, so we made some pretty massive changes um, from revision three to revision four. Uh, and then even since revision four has come out, you know, some of the feedback we got was like the change, you need to go a little bit further. We need to get a little bit more than we need a little bit more detail. So a little bit more detail on how to use mobile driver's license and verifiable credentials, not just that I can, but what are some additional protocols and steps that need to be put in place for us to actually be able to use those. Um, things like phishing resistant authentication. Um, we've got the definition, we've got the, the approach, um, but since we published pass keys have become a much bigger thing, right? And so how are we going to deal with this new concept, this new paradigm of not just a cryptographic authenticator, but a cryptographic authenticator that can move. Um, And while we had opened the door to that and the idea that you could potentially replicate a key to multiple different devices to make it a little bit easier for the user to sign in from different parts of their account, 
we didn't go so far as to kind of figure out how is that syncing fabric, how are the back end components, how is how do we deal with it as a as a paradigm changer. Um, and the reason we couldn't go much further is because they weren't really done with the the underlying protocols. We hadn't seen a lot of adoption. Things like sharing of those credentials was something that was just emerging right as we started to put this together. Um, so we have some more content that we've got to deal with around things like whether and how and to what degree pass keys can be used. Um, for those of you who have been paying attention to us, we are at the, the kind of phase of we do think these are consistent with AL2 multi-factor authentication when certain conditions are met, but there's other things that we want to apply to that conversation. So even though we had made a lot of changes, uh, there's still more changes that we're going to be making. So uh, I guess the kind of core takeaway there is April, May, keep your eyes on the NIST website. Um, we should be publishing an updated draft then, and then we'll probably have about a 30, 45 day uh, public comment period after that, and hopefully proceed to final sometime uh, sometime next year. Exciting stuff. And yeah, Pesky, super exciting. You mentioned digital driver's licenses, super exciting. I want to get back to that in a minute. But before that, I want to talk about something that's not super exciting or ask you about. So are, is it 863 that includes guidelines for passwords? Are those going to be changed in revision for it all? They were. So, th so they were updated. Um, and so we, we had, in revision three, we kind of made the first toe-in-the-water type steps towards changing some of the things around passwords. So we had, there's two different ways we reflect language within 63. There are should, which is a recommendation, and there are shall statements, which are mandatory. Um, we've also got may statements, but that's just more like, you can do it if you want. Um, but we put a, a bunch of recommendations around things like not arbitrarily requiring users to change their passwords, not mandating things like complexity requirements. Um, you know, and we found that you know through research, for the most part, when you apply things like random rotation, especially short period random rotation, like 30, 60, 90 days, um, and when you apply arbitrary um, complexity requirements, you ultimately end up with users creating the easiest password they can create in order to meet those policy requirements. And it's not typically the most secure, right? You know, it's the one, two, three, four, five. And now I need to add something out. All right, exclamation point. And then the next time you do, you add another exclamation point. Or, you know, so you end up with these kind of efforts to to meet with those requirements. And what you end up with is something that is that that the user one probably is creating as, as less secure and also typically creating patterns that are easy for, for bad, bad actors to guess. So we made those recommendations to remove your kind of random rotation, remove um, password complexity requirements. Um, we kept those as recommendations initially when we put out Rev4, or, or we were going to keep them as recommendations. And then we kind of got a lot of feedback that was like, no, we actually really like this and this should be mandated, this should require. So, we did in the December version that we published last year, um, put out, I mean, I guess two years ago, um, we did in fact update the requirements so that it is now mandatory that you do not have, uh, have complexity requirements, that you do not have um, random or arbitrary um, updates of passwords. So those well, have been changed. that. Thank you. I would yeah. love to take credit for it, but it's, it's, this happened long before me. So um, really and smart people, people actually started you know, wholesale doing it. But I think some people think, oh, yeah, we'll follow all the others, but we're going to make people change their password every 90 days. Just yeah. because, you know, I mean, we've been doing it forever. Yeah, it was the status quo. It was the status quo. And um, I think people just, they're, they're, I will say the gut reaction from a lot of the security community was, we can't change that. You know, yeah. complexity makes it harder. And, you know, and, and rotation, make sure that if you've got a compromise, it'll be taken care of. And all those things are kind of understood. But at the end of the day, you know, we really wanted people to focus on you know, length, length over complexity and memorability over random kind of rotation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So enough of that boring topic. Mobile driver's licenses. Um, what is NIST up to in this area? Are you creating a standard around mobile driver's licenses. Does that mean states are going to start doing it the same way? Well, we don't have authority over the states. Um, I will say we have been actively involved in the international standard here. Um, uh, so the 18013-5 
is the kind of core standard around mobile driver's license and dash seven is the online version. Um, bottom line is those are the kind of international standards that have been put together. They're the starting point for a lot of this. Um, and, and what really needs to happen is kind of that transition into one, how do we make this work within the U.S. context um, because it's an international standard? Two, how do we make it as easy as possible for organizations to actually adopt and leverage these things? And then three, how do we plug some of the gaps that that like an international standard still has to make sure it fits our con- our own context for privacy and security purposes? Because again, they wrote this. You know, there's a lot of focus on like the data model and the elements that go into it and and the components and and core you know, necessary functional things, but there's going to be additional layers that need to be layered on top of this to make sure when it's ultimately implemented, it's done in a way that's consistent with how we want it to be done in the United States. So some of the things we're doing, one, we're integrating it into 863. Um, So these ideas of mobile driver's license can be used as essentially a piece of identity evidence. And and really, we're not restricting it to mobile driver's license. That is a, a form of these kinds of credentials. We're also looking at things like verifiable credentials, both the W3C model, as well as, you know, just kind of generally referring to cryptographically verifiable things about me um, or things about you. Um, So mobile driver's license are one way of doing that. And and again, they can represent a whole identity, like a driver's license, or it can represent individual attributes that have been selectively disclosed. So date of birth, address, or just over 21. Um, So looking to how can we fit those into the identity proofing process, it's in 863A, our digital identity guidelines. Um, How can we build the right requirements around conveying that information? Um, So we're kind of putting that within the bucket of 863C, looking at it from the concept of federation, because it is kind of an identity assertion. Not exactly, but close enough as far as our guidance goes. Um, And then looking at how we can also work within the international community to continue to improve the underlying protocols that need to support it. So we're actively working within the OpenID Foundation to monitor um, where they're doing the OpenID Connect for verifiable presentation and verifiable credential issuance work. Um, Lots of acronyms, but they're the ones doing kind of some of the underlying protocols for how you exchange the information. Um, And we're kind of keeping an eye on the work that they're doing there. We're also working within W3C where they're still kind of trying to figure out what might be next as far as like the browser APIs that might need to be developed in order to support things like mobile driver license and verifiable credentials um, in a more consistent manner across different um, different browsers. Uh, and then we're working very closely with our security and privacy folks to start thinking about how do we make sure when these get implemented in particular, they're done in a way, or at least states have the guidance to, d- to do it in a way um, that will preserve the privacy of individuals because it's got a lot of a lot of potential value mobile driver's license for privacy protective approaches i mean selective disclosure which is essentially being able to only share what you want to share is a kind of key concept however on the other end of the spectrum a lot of times this is issuing source information so coming from dmv coming from the states and a lot of times the verification you know might require some kind of a call back to the state so making sure that you eliminate the unnecessary kind of phone home aspect of things and kind of enhance the the kind of uh, the privacy side of things to make sure that the, when these are deployed, um, they're done in a way that doesn't infringe upon people's privacy. Um, and you know, again, we, we don't have authority over the state. So our goal is to help create the guidance that can be pointed to um, by states to, to figure out, you know, how do we make sure that we are we're doing things in a way that is that is going to protect our, you know, the, the residents of our state. Um, but again, all we can kind of do is create those those pathways to doing it right, um, and the states will ultimately have to deploy it um, on their own, <laughs> based upon their own laws and regulations. And that's one of the things that I think makes MDL in particular so complicated is it's not just a technology solution, and it's not just a single technology solution. It's a layering of various different standards and protocols to support an outcome, and then on top of that, there's the kind of policy and governance side that's going to vary potentially by 50 plus states and um, and uh, uh, territories in the U.S. Well, I live in North Carolina, so I'm hopeful that <laughs> at least some somewhere we'll catch up <laughs> um, and try to catch up on the mobile driver's license. You answered the question that I was going to ask around really kind of the, the state's role in this with versus the federal government and I guess I see a lot of organizations, not just government or state governments, um, sorry, um, but a lot of just, you know, for-profit businesses, for example, rely on the standards or seek out those standards before doing things. So I feel like 
there are some states that are ahead of the curve, smaller number of states at this point. NIST comes out with a standard or releases a publication, and then it seems like the floodgates start to open a little bit more because those pathways have been created. Is that a fair perception that I have, or do you see it differently? So, I mean, I think the uh, it's it, states are going to kind of move at their own pace, no matter what. And and I think from time to time, they will point to NIST guidelines. I know 53 has actually been pretty popular with the states. Um, I think in this particular case, I think it's such a unique situation with, with what mobile driver's license are, um, that even if we were to come out with guidance uh, to support the international standard, because the international standard, you know, the Dash 5 has been out for, I think, a couple of years now. Um, so some states have really jumped on board really fast to, to help implement it. Others are kind of waiting to see. But a lot of that has to do with the speed of their own legislation, their own internal government processes, the politics. It's very complicated. So, um, you know, I, I think we I'd like to say that as we come out with guidance on this kind of topic, um, it will help aid adoption. But I think this is such a, a challenging kind of political conversation that I don't know that um, I don't know that that necessarily changes the speed at which the uh, the, the states will adopt. It, and I will say another, another thing that we're looking at is is you know because Dash Five really focuses on kind of the, the the data model and the physical interaction. So like if you're to use your mobile driver's license at the airport, which is the primary use case now, um, there's kind of a lag in how we can use this online. Uh, while we wait for Dash Seven, which is the the other the online standard that's still in in finalization, uh, and so what we want to be prepared with is particularly for federal agencies that want to consume what's already there and what's already available is being able to provide what we call kind of relying party guidance. So how do I take this, integrate it into my workflows, and actually use it? Um, and so we're going to do some of that in 63C, but we're also looking at trying to do some work within our NCCOA, um, National Cybersecurity Center of Excellence, to actually get some practical, how do I consume a mobile driver's license type guidance together. Have we moved past this being a technology problem and more of a policy and sort of configuration issue at this point and making sure that everyone's kind of the same page on that? Or are there still technical deficiencies that you're seeing that throw wrinkles into this somehow? I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say that it, it's deficiencies. Um, I would say there's still gaps, right? And again, they're still trying to figure out and finalize the version of the standard that says this is how you do it online. And that's a, it's a pretty major gap. Um, and that's cobbled together multiple different pathways through things like the OpenID Foundations, OpenID Connect for verifiable presentations. It also leverages you know, some additional sitting APIs within W3C. So, I mean, there's a lot of pieces and parts that need to be put together. And I think... We've got a good understanding of what it looks like in a physical use case because we have seen a pretty decent number of, of transactions. TSA has been piloting a lot of the stuff. I mean, so we've got a good understanding of what still needs to be fixed and updated and improved there from a physical perspective. We just don't know what we don't know yet from a, a an online perspective. And so I think what we'll find is that you know the standard is going to work. It's, it's going to be interoperable at least to start. The challenge is, what is it going to look like in implementation? What implementation challenges are we going to run into? I mean, one of the major ones is discoverability of of like the wallet that stores your your mobile driver's license. How do we present that to the user? How do we let the um, you know like an online application actually select or allow the user to select the wallet that they want to use? Because again, we we might find ourselves in a future where I've got five wallets, uh, ten wallets, twelve wallets. I, I don't want us to get there. I prefer we don't replace. 100 passwords with 100 wallets. But, you know, there are going to be scenarios where there's still some kinks to work out that we need to figure out as we actually move into implementation. And again, some of that interaction with the browsers and wallet selections and stuff, something that's still being worked in, in particular within W3C, but also within the ISO context. I totally agree with you on the wallet side. I feel like we're headed towards multiple wallets, and I don't know if that's any better than <laughs> multiple passwords, but hopefully we're going to figure it out. I think, you know, it's... You know, which is the wallet that you use for what is probably the question to ask because I think yeah. people will probably gravitate towards, well, this is my finance wallet or this is my social media wallet or this is my government wallet or whatever, right? Things like that. My, I mean, I don't, I don't know if this is officially like in this stance. My personal view is like, um, at the end of the day, we want to give the end user as many options as possible. Um, what we don't want to say is in order to do 20 transactions, you have to have 20 wallets. If I choose to use 20 wallets, that's perfectly fine. Um, but I think you're, you're exactly right. Like if I want to have a, one wallet that is my 
you know, my core identity wallet or my core transaction wallet that's got my government stuff, my official stuff, my mobile driver's license. Sure, I can I can do that. But if I want to have my, you know, my my wallet full of, uh, you know, uh, Costco cards and 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 uh, and wholesale cards and and um, you know my uh, baking club, you know, card that I can go get, you know, a free scone because I have I've made twelve purchases. I, you know, I should be able to do that too, and not necessarily have to intermingle those things. So our our goal is to really make sure that we can help build out the standards so they're interoperable, um, so that any wallet can do anything it needs to as long as it meets a certain set of standards and expectations, and then also be able to make sure that those credential types are interoperable across potential use cases to give the user as many options as possible. I see it's kind of a parallel with where social logins uh, kind of started, where everyone kind of has picked their favorite social login to start with. And they've also picked ones which ones they'll never use. <laughs> so I know people who are very much like, yes, if it's Google, that's what I'm using. Or I am never going to use Facebook as my login, right? There's kind of things that have come up along that way. And I feel like we're kind of headed sort of that direction, maybe with wallets. It's, it seems kind of similar to me. A little bit, but hopefully... Uh even more choice because i think you know as much as we do see like a lot of options for you know the core users the core or the core kind of uh identity providers there the core social sign on um you know sometimes you'll go to a website and it'll your facebook will be the only option uh, mm -hmm. or their kind of local sign in thing so hopefully we see a bit a bit more optionality um as it comes to wallets in the future but i mean you know there's going to be a lot of business drivers beyond just the um the technical context that we support so this has been a great conversation, and I want to ask you one final question before we start to wrap things up. Um, we did an episode, uh, it feels like a couple years ago at this point, it was like episode 150-something. Jim might be able to look it up while I'm kind of stalling for time. But we asked this question of what is the difference between identity and access management and digital identity? And we sent this kind of call out to everybody that we could think of, and we got a lot of responses. I think we got like 10 responses. And everybody had a different answer. So now I'm curious, from your perspective, Ryan, no pressure, but what is the difference between identity and access management and digital identity? So, and we actually had this debate. So we also published, I think, about this time last year, two years ago, we published our, our, the first version of our digital identi or identity and access management roadmap. And originally, we were going to call it a digital identity roadmap. And then we had this massive internal debate about what is digital identity, what is identity and access management, how do they overlap, do they overlap? Um, so the view I've kind of landed on is digital identity is a kind of component within the broader identity and access management sphere. So digital identity is really the focus on, you know, that online representation of, of a user, their attributes, and, and who they are. Now that fits into a larger context of what can I do in the authorization space? Uh, what actions should I be taking in the kind of, you know, uh, access control space and what entitlements are attached to me? You know, those aren't necessarily inherent in who I am in my identity, but they are things that are attached to my identity once it's been established. So we kind of look at digital identity as more of a foundational component or the foundational component of identity and access management more broadly. Okay. So June 2022, episode 151, our fact checker, Jim, working feverishly behind the scenes typing me notes as we're talking through here. Um, all right, let's start to wrap things up. Uh, we like to end shows on a lighter note. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Uh, I think a lot of people will really get a lot of value out of it. But let's talk a little bit about hockey. Uh, I know you're a hockey fan. Yep. If you could Thank pick you. any former professional hockey player to join your beer league team for a season, who would it be and why? All right. So the, I'm a, I'm a, I grew up in the Massachusetts area, a huge Boston Bruins fan. And so like when you asked me this question, the most immediate thing that came to my head was it would have to be Bobby Orr, right? It would have to be Bobby Orr. Um, and then I actually pivoted a little bit. Um, and I think the right answer is actually Mario Lemieux for me. Uh, and, and one of the reasons it is because number one, He's, he's a monster. He's huge. He's absolutely huge. So you roll him in beer league, you know, not only is he going to roll with the best hands in the game, the best shot in the game, he's also, nobody's going to mess with him. He's, he's going to be an absolute monster. Um, and, you know, Bobby Orr is he's, he's good sized, but, you know, he, he wasn't, he wasn't the biggest, the biggest guy in town. So I think, you know, and, and right now my dad, my uncle, 
probably my grandfather are currently writing me out of their wills, but um, I think I got to go Mario Lemieux. I, I really do think I have to go with that route. So that's that's my answer until I get uh, disowned. <laughs> Jim, who would you pick for your beer league for a hockey player? So I grew up a Philadelphia Flyers fan. Oh. And... <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. So there's so many great ones to choose from. But I think the answer to this question is pick the best goalie. So I'm going to go Ron Hexall, which is like right in my era. Because here's what I think. It's like I might not score, but if you put Ron Hexall in a beer league hockey, I mean, you're not going to do any worse than a 0-0 tie. You're, and you're going to get an enforcer too, because he will absolutely uh, he'll, he'll he'll throw the gloves down too. He shot a few goals too. <laughs> yeah, so he, he might come out and shoot. He had two or three goals. I don't remember how many exactly, but yeah, yeah. And but that was so rare back then. I think it's a, a more goalie is a good pick. Now. A yeah. goalie is a good pick. I, I gotta give you that. What about you, Jeff? Well, I'm a Chicago Blackhawks fan, so I'm I'm scrolling through my roster of. Blackhawks. I, you know, I grew up in the era of Chris Chelios and Ed Belfour and Jeremy Roenick. Uh, I'm torn, man. It's it's got to be somewhere between Chris Chelios, Duncan Keith, and Bob Probert. And the only oh, reason man. I mentioned Bob Probert is because like, was yeah, he was a beast. And he would fight anyone and everyone at the same time. I was at a Blackhawks game where he actually scaled the glass and started to go after a fan. <laughs> Wow. So I feel like that would be the perfect kind of uh, compliment to the beer league team is I, you don't need a goalie when everyone's on their back. <laughs> so we're scared to score. <laughs> right. Exactly. So yeah, I'll go with Bob Probert just uh, for the That's... pure goon enforcer role. And uh, I feel like uh, that's, that's my final answer. <laughs> I do think that that Ryan liked us until he found out who our hockey allegiance was with, but that's why I went to the end. Fact, yeah. The fact that you have hockey allegiance, that I'm a I'm a hardcore you should love my sport kind of person. So um I, I prefer the having hot unless you're a Canadians fan, and then we'll have to have a completely different conversation. But uh, I can I can find the time of day as long as you've got the uh as long as you've got the allegiance to to a team. I actually happened to be in Edmonton last winter during hockey season, and um they were playing the Boston Bruins, and I was floored by how many Bruins fans flew all the way out to Edmonton. Edmonton is not the easiest place to get to. Like Calgary is totally different. Maybe a lot of people flew to Calgary and drove up to Edmonton, but I mean, Bruins fans are well-traveled. Yeah. And I, I'll say every time I try I go to one of these identity conferences, I, uh, I try and see if I can, I can get a game in, not necessarily Bruins game, but a game. So, I mean, out at Authenticated Seattle a couple of years ago, I got to see the Kraken play. It was fantastic. Um, I was up at an ICAO conference and I, uh, in Montreal, and I, I was intending to go to the Montreal Canadiens game, only uh, there was some kind of a technical glitch with the, uh, with the stub hub, and I got all the way to the rink and never got the ticket, so I didn't get to go. But, um, yeah, I, I always try and, uh, try and get to whatever the local rink is whenever I, uh, whenever I get out there. I feel like hockey is still relatively undiscovered for a lot of people because I find playoff hockey, the atmosphere in a stadium is unmatched for anything I've ever been in. I mean, yeah, when the Chicago Blackhawks were winning all the Stanley Cups for a few years there, it was unbelievable. Yeah, you're sorry about that. <laughs> hey, it was our turn. Um, it was <laughs> unbelievable to be in the stadium and there's not a bad seat in the house and you can just feel like it, you get goosebumps just kind of being in there and I've never experienced that with other sports. Uh, you know, I've been to Bears games. I've been to Bulls games. Even when the Bulls were in the 90s and with Jordan, you know, it was not the same. It was pretty close. I'll be honest, it was pretty close. But playoff hockey in Chicago at United Center with the Blackhawks, hands down the best sporting event for, you know, the environment that I've ever been to. Yeah, I think you don't appreciate hockey until you get to see it in person. I think... It doesn't translate as well to TV, particularly if, if you're new to the sport and you don't really have a, a strong idea of what's going on. But when you go watch in person, you get that, you know, Jeff, to your point, the the kind of electricity of the crowd. Plus you get, you know, you get to see how fast, how fast the game is and how, how quickly the puck moves and how big the guys are. They're huge. They're enormous. Uh, so it's, you know, it's... Um, 
it's it's one of those things where most people, when you finally drag them to a hockey game, um, they end up at least falling in love with the with the in person side of the game. It's uh, a little bit harder on TV, but um, but I love it. It's it's yeah, core, it's core NHL to NHL games, and I agree with what Jeff was saying. Like the energy is so high. I've also been to minor league hockey, and the sound of a hockey game is so cool. Like when you're at a minor league hockey game, there's you know, generally not as many people, right? The place doesn't packed, but you can really hear the game. You can hear the players talking. You hear the the stick hitting the ice. Really cool sounding game. Yeah, college hockey too. College hockey is a uh, another thing that uh, you, you know you can for five bucks, ten bucks, you can go watch some unbelievable players. You can get super close to the ice, hear what's going on, see what's going on. Um, it's a uh, yeah. It's, it's it's a it's a really phenomenal sport, and everyone should love it as much as I do. It's not great for watching the game, but if you get the chance to sit on the glass in the corners, it's a completely different experience. You're banging on the glass, you know, people are getting checked right into that you know corner, you know, all the time, and it's a totally you can't see anything, <laughs> especially on the other end of the ice, but it's right inside of your face, you know, with all the all the the glass shaking and stuff like that. It's it's fun. Yeah, I'm more of like a halfway up the bowl yep. kind of guy. So you yeah, I mean, at this point, I want to watch and see the sport and go back and forth, and I'm with you. All right, I think we could talk Pocky for a while, but we're we're up over an hour at this point, so I want to make sure we... Ryan, thank you so much for being part of this. This is yeah, a great conversation. Um, we'll have links in our show notes to you know connect with Ryan, to NIST 863 for if you want to check that out. Keep an eye out for Revision 4 coming out to a NIST website near you at some point here in the next couple of months. Um, we'll be on the web. We still are on the web, I should say. IDACpodcast.com on Twitter or X or whatever it's called by the time you hear this at IDAC Podcast, uh, Mastodon at IDAC Podcast at infosec.exchange. Connect with Jim and I on LinkedIn. Use that voicemail and win a copy of Phil Winley's book coming out in a couple, well, about a week or so, roughly. So you got about a week to go. Uh, and, uh, yeah, don't forget to use our discount code for identity week, America, IDAC three, zero, get 30% off all the identity week conferences through 2000, 2024, I should say, uh, Amsterdam, Singapore, DC, uh, we'll hope to see you at the DC one. So with that, we'll go ahead and leave it here for this week. Thanks everybody for listening and we'll talk with everyone in the next. You've been listening to identity at the center. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at identityatthecenter.com and find us on Twitter at IDAC Podcast. See you next time on Identity at the Center.